Hello everyone, this is Reverend Yan, and we are here for our third chat on the instincts and the Enneagram. This is kind of a more advanced Enneagram series, and I am excited to be interviewing my friend Patrick, who's hailing all the way from Denmark today. So I'm just keeping my eye out here to wait for him to join us and Let's see here. I'm going to check this out and see if I can get him on. He's working to get logged in. There you are. Okay, Patrick, I am sending you a note here. Join the conversation and fingers crossed. Hello, everyone. There you are. Yay. <laughs> So good to see you. So hello, everyone. And I will introduce Patrick more formally in a second. I just realized I have to scoot back here. My head's going to be cut off. Um, so so today uh, I have the honor of talking to Patrick about his sort of his awareness around his Enneagram, in particular, the Enneagram instinctual stacking and, and his sort of journey of greater self-awareness and transformation through the Enneagram. But I just want to begin by first saying hi to those of you joining us. So good to see you here. Feel free, and especially if your um, moniker doesn't like list your name, I'd love to see who's all who's here by having you chime in, share your name and type and stacking if you know it or any questions you might have. Hello, Valerie. So again, we are here to talk about the instincts primarily, and I'm going to actually have uh, Patrick more formally introduce himself in a second. But I want to launch in by sharing that, you know, Evolving Enneagram is really focused on uh, global transformation through personal transformation, you know, with individual work that we do, but also um, in ways in which community work and the ways in which you know our relationships with each other bring out uh, both the best and the worst and help support us in this journey of awakening if you will and so today again we have patrick all the way from denmark and i'm just going to launch in and have you introduce yourself and share a bit i want to first hear about your personal journey um, and how you came to know your type including your stacking so yeah, Patrick. Okay. <laughs> so, how do you read me across the ocean and all that? Am I loud and clear? Oh, yes. Oh, do you want me? Okay, I'll introduce that. Okay, so I want to share okay. beforehand um, the amazing way that Patrick and I got to meet one another. So, um, basically, one of my students who found me through one of my YouTube sermons was linked up with the IEA, so the International Enneagram Association in Denmark. And they became aware of my work, particularly in building conscious community. And so we had this session where I served as a consultant for the IEA in Denmark. And guess who? Patrick is on there and serves on the board there. So yeah, actually, let's start by hearing a little bit about like, what you do with the IEA Denmark and all your activities there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So if for me, it started with the COVID situation because we were all at home and we still want to connect. So a very good friend of mine, Annabella, uh, we, uh, we tried to do some online Enneagram uh, events. Um, and the IEA board thought it would be very interesting to actually have that uh, as a space for the members to link up with each other and just discuss the Enneagram. And uh, they wanted me to host it. Uh, yeah. So that was like my way in. And then we have, we've done panels. We've talked uh, instincts and types uh, over the Zoom platform. Uh, yeah, and I was I was mainly the host, and so normally I am interviewing you. <laughs> so having a 
So now we're going to talk about me or like mm, out of comfort zone, but uh, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Yeah, wonderful. And and so so you serve on the board over there. And so actually, since we're already on the topic of your professional work with the Enneagram, I'd love for folks to hear a little bit more and feel free to share about IEA, um, the global conference in Sweden next year as yeah. well to talk about some of the work you're doing there. So people have a framework for sort of your the larger context in which you both do personal as well as professional work with the Enneagram. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me see. <laughs> uh, so a little back, I uh, I started actually on a uh, NLP journey where I wanted to become coach. I wanted to know how to help people, especially people who's uh, who's having severe uh, issues on on with uh, stress. Um, and through the NLP journey, you say. Um, I I um, I met the Enneagram as a almost like a, a multi tool and a quick guide to get get to know clients even better. Uh, turns out that I uh, that was my biggest um, step in my life, you would say. So I thought that participating on a course, becoming a coach, and all that. Um, that should have been something who, that could really uh, make a difference in my life. But the, the, the thing that really changed something inside of me, that was actually when I met the Enneagram and I met my type. Wow. So, so that was, that was uh, the thing that just was there all the time. And I, uh, I just knew by then that I, need to, I, I just needed to learn more about the Enneagram. Um, so in my professional life, I'm actually working in the military and I work as a health and safety ins inspector. So, you know, I wear uniforms every day and fitting in. So when people hear that I'm a type four, they'll go like, how, how can you, how can you do that? <laughs> how, how can you be a type four and work in the military uh, as a soldier? Um, and, and my quick response is, don't worry, there's only me. <laughs> so I'm very unique. No, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, so yeah, so, and, uh, and I actually use the Enneagram now in my work um, because getting to know what's the motivation uh, within my colleagues, what's the motivation within my leader or in the, in the people that I manage is very, very key to uh, uh, um, a good work health environment, actually. Um, and the Enneagram is just an amazing uh, guidance for that. Wonderful. Yeah, amazing work that you're doing. I'm so excited that you're, you're doing this work in the world. And, and, you know, a lot of people, though, you know, they put themselves out as teachers, etc., but they don't aren't necessarily also working the inner journey. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you here to talk to folks is just how touched I've been um, in circles where I've gotten to hear you share personally. I mean, like very personally, you know, oftentimes about like the awarenesses that you've gained through knowing your type and your stacking and how that served, you know, in your marriage, you know, as a father, but also, you know, also as, you know, who you are in the world, right? Your relationship to yourself. And, and so I would love to hear first, you know, how you, okay, so people are like, how are you a four? How did you know? Like, what is it about, like, the type four that, like, you really connected with where you're like, that's, this is how I know. Yeah. So it wasn't easy, actually. I mean, there was a lot of hints that I should look down in, uh, in type four. And uh, I also had a trainer who was uh, pretty sure that's where I belonged. But there was just something I could not really get. You know, the drama, the, the um, obvious longing. I just, I just had issues with it, kind of. So you, and uh, also the envy, right? I was like, it's very easy for me to say that I'm was something else because I'm not envy at all. Well, yeah. it was hidden, let me say that. So so what happened is that later on in my Enneagram journey, and I was like, okay, 
type four was probably the closest and I'm waiting for type 10 to show up because I'm, <laughs> I must be a very unique and special kind of type four. Um, but, but then the, uh, then the instincts show up and the subtype mm -hmm. and, and then I heard about the counter type. So the type that actually move against the passion, the passion of envy. And, and to me, seeing these kind of descriptions about how I actually, as a self-preservation for, am longing in, in the hidden, right? I was like, yeah. whoa, yeah. whoa. <laughs> wow. And so, so that's, that's where I, I really figured out that it, it has to be right there. That's yeah. where I belong. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. I think because, I mean, one of the reasons I want to teach the instincts is how much mistyping happened before the instincts were disseminated really into the larger world and the awareness that, that um, the classic type four, let's just, I'll just talk about that a little bit. You know, they say that, you know, all fours are rooted in suffering, you know, all fours suffer, but the self-preservation four is long suffering, yeah. you know, oh, that you bear that suffering, you suck it up, you know, and that in a way, so the story goes, increases your suffering, because not only do I suffer, but I have to hide my suffering and look cheerful or look, you know, get it together and meet the world, bear through. And that can definitely create like a persona outside that does isn't obvious. It's not, I mean, you don't come across as, as sad or sulky, right? Exactly. Like you kind of move forward. And that's so important for folks listening to like, if you're wondering about type and four seems to resonate with you, but like you don't identify so much with that. I mean, social fours you often see like sad eyes right they're even like like wet eyes like there's this like mm. tearful affect because there's a greater identification with that core of suffering right in the social instinct when we can talk about that in a sec knowing we can talk about your stacking in a second but just i'll just do a little bit of teaching around this three and the, so the so the joke is i mean i, I say this you know tongue-in-cheek a bit the self-preservation for is long suffering the self uh, the social for suffers and the sexual for makes other people suffer you know like is is that little just short way of branding it because in that so like in the sexual for energy then there's more obvious anger it's like almost like there's still that deep root of shame that is common to all fours but there's a shamelessness that comes out for like, oh, I can think horrible thoughts about myself, but if you do, you know, then there's a lashing out like, and so somehow if I put you down like that, making others suffer in the sexual four, then, then I will be okay. Like I will have defended like the sense of self. And so recognizing that within fours and that, 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 commonality of suffering the commonality of shame as well being embedded in all of them that there are these distinctions and that at least the way i teach the enneagram you know some people focus just on that top that subtype you know for you again which would be the self-preservation for but i have seen differences if your self-preservation and then your second instinct is social that looks a little different than if your second instinct you know is is sexual and so I would love for you to share a bit about your stacking and how maybe that plays out in your life and how maybe longing um, and feelings get expressed, you know, based on that. First, even sharing what details you're open to sharing about, you know, about the self-preservation and then kind of moving into, well, what does that sexual blind spot look like for you? Mm. Yeah, because it's, it's, it was so interesting to actually go down uh, and, and be very curious about how am I affected by these instincts. And uh, it was like a mirror when I saw that um, tears, for example, my tears, my, my sadness is not shared with anybody. Um, so, so unless we are watching a movie or, some, or like uh, somebody hurt, uh like a, or the you know the extreme house renovation you know my tear goes ballistic but when it comes to something that's really really 
hurtful or death, I, it's, it's, it's like something is blocking it from getting out of my body. Mm. So I'm, um, so, 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 so I, I try to work it through within myself. Um, and then I can be in this suffering for, yeah, long time, actually. Um, but, but not as a victim of it. It's just, mm. I'm just, I can, I, I can handle this one. And then I, I also uh, r- realized that, oh, that I could be mistyped like a type seven because mm-hmm. I always bring a smile, I always bring joy and always bring, and, and I actually have issues with anger. And uh, I, like my, 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 my courage to just speak my mind, speak my emotions out is, is very well hidden. Uh, if it's some kind of emotions, the, the the not so pretty emotions. I love to give you a compliment. I love to give you a, a smile in return and stuff like that. But when it comes to my emotions and how I'm hurt, um, you probably won't know it unless you really, really pay attention. Yeah. Um, and I remember also my my uh, my trainer. He he talked about type four and drama, and I was like, I'm not dra- dramatic at all. And he's like. Have you heard about the silent way of being dramatic? <laughs> <laughs> so I normally take the room. I normally uh, network with everybody and, and, and make sure there's like good vibes, almost like a nine, right? So to make sure everybody's here and everybody's okay and stuff like that. And then on, on days where I suffer, I'm just there and I'm not saying anything. It's so dramatic. <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, uh, but I get it now. I, I see what I do. Okay, so yeah, and then about the stacking right after self-preservation is sh- social, so that maybe also support the idea of being a part of something that's bigger than myself, right? And being sure that I am a part of IEA, I'm a part of of our group and and, and stuff like that. And in the bottom is is sexual, is that very very uh, d- uh, deep longing uh, for connection and being uh two like one and stuff like that and mm. and i probably recognize it for all my relationships with friends family stuff like that that is when i'm when i'm in it i'm in it i mean i'm, I'm there and as soon as i'm doing something else it's not that i don't love them or care mm. about them or wish them everything mm. well but i just forget I don't pay attention to all my connections in the same way as I probably pay attention to some more practical stuff. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, So there are a few things that came up for me as you were talking. Mm. One thing is that um, going back again, since we're teaching about the instincts, that I'm paying attention to practical stuff is such a self-preservation instinct. Like there's, there, you know, it, it's practical resources. It's, it's, hey, you have your, do you have your water handy? I don't have my water handy. <laughs> you know, you just, like, just awareness of those kinds of things, right? Or your drink, you know? So, so like the, the tendency to kind of, you know, there is this sense for all self-preservation types. It's not selfish, but there's a me and mine. Like, like my body, like my energy, my resources, and there's like a holding of it in. And I just want to share a reflection as well that it struck me as I launched into our conversation, you know, and like I got the strong, like sexual dominant, you know, like kind of energy. And like, I, I realized I was like, I could just feel your, like you had this like subdued, you're like, you're like here. And I'm like, oh, I remember now we have to go after Patrick, like, like, he doesn't, like, you know, and because I'm watching, I'm watching the comments and um, oh. Sam, any orgasm said, you do still have such a type four aura. This is when you were talking about the seven energy, right? So mm. you might have that smile, but you don't go toward me. It's more like, come over here. Aren't I interesting enough? And, if, and it's like, work at it just a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Like work at it just a bit, right? Like you can feel that and it's, and, you mm. know, beautiful. It's like, like, but it is, it's like a way of also testing, like, does she care enough 
is she gonna is she going to move toward am i going to move toward and i want to name um for those listening that you know fours are in the, the withdrawn stance you know of the social style and so uh, so what that means is you know in contrast to the assertive stance of the seven that you know you might still have that smile but like the assertive stance of the seven goes after what it wants and the four is like if i want something i go backward <laughs> like 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 you come to me like there's a way it wants to pull in and you can feel that right mm -hmm. um so very skillfully done <laughs> you know mind you but but the awareness and you know you reminded me when i did a panel on fours that there was also a moment though like where all the fours were like oh yeah this identification almost like with victimhood or with weakness and like one person like literally sitting in a closet waiting like waiting for someone to save them you know and it is that sort of like if i go over here will you come after me and the moment of healing which is like no one's coming like no one's coming like if i want to participate that there's some way in which i have to take that sense of agency and kind of move more into being you know not the object here you know but the subject like the actor and and so so yeah i don't know if anything comes up for you around that i welcome that sharing but or if that was like too <laughs> too exposing no. yeah no not at all and uh because because we're in this uh enneagram group as well talking about type sexuality and stuff like that and i and i you know realize that is that is also some kind of selfish way of just leaning back and want you to to come to me right with your lust or with with your admiration or anything because i'm here uh just waiting <laughs> for for this to happen uh, and and uh, if it doesn't happen then all all my uh emotions were right <laughs> uh and uh yeah so uh but but uh, yeah and you also mentioned resources and i think mm -hmm. that also when we talk about instincts we talk about self-preservation it doesn't matter what type but for for me i'm also very aware of my emotional resources because because i need to make sure that i can stand anything also emotionally which makes me also very strong mentally strong and i've been to right now in the media afghanistan is the thing i've been there five times wow. so how can you be there so distance to your family to to the ones you love and how can you survive in that and to me it was easier that it probably would be for let's say a sexual fool i'm i'm sure about it because i could i could be in that longing i could be at that distance and 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 i could be strong in it and i could find joy and all that stuff even in uh, one of the hardest places on earth yeah so amazing yeah you um again i keep hearing the word like you bear it like there's mm. like you can bear that suffering um and there's a holding of that and and also something i've seen which is um you know it wasn't until i started delving into the instincts that i come to realize that see your dominant is my blind spot and when self preservation is blind i as much as i thought i was such the strong person in the world there's something where it's the self press instinct not mine you know that is all about like self reliance there's like a pride in like i know how to do that myself whereas if i had to do something myself especially if it was anything related to household maintenance i would be resentful and i would have almost like that dependency feeling and i realized growing up i was like my siblings were like yeah why don't you know how to do that like like that self preservation being my blind spot being resourceful being self sufficient in that way was like never even something i desired but i see in self preservation dominance like a strong sense of that like like me and i got this and like and i know how like the know how to do this you know and that there's pride in that whereas i'm like you could do it for me go ahead <laughs> like you know so so just interesting there um so if you have anything to share about that I'd love to hear but also I would love to hear to whatever extent you're open to sharing about the role of understanding 
sort of your type and your instinctual stacking and how you relate um, to your wife or to your family? Like how has, what was it like before the Enneagram and then how has it changed because of knowing the Enneagram? If you could share that. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So I think before the Enneagram, oh, I was a I was a soldier, <laughs> and I, I, I was um, I was uh, spending a lot of time on being best at what I do and being yeah um, skillful enough to to manage and uh, I guess it also affected my relations with my wife and kids and I constantly was uh, looking at an online for what's the best. Uh, material stuff to support our needs and, and and stuff like that and i wanted to create some kind of safety net uh for for my family as well and um and i actually had a hard time speaking with oh about emotions mm. the reason why i wanted a nlp uh coach uh training in in the first place was actually because I never talked about emotions and if people were stressed out or anything like that, I sensed it so much and I was scared that if I went into that room, I would affect them in a bad way, make mm. stuff even worse. So, so I wanted, I wanted to learn about being in that space because uh, I, I thought that's, that's a place where I could grow and it also happened because uh, knowing about my type uh, also led me to be more open about what's going on inside of me and showing that part as well in the communication with my kids and with my wife and with my friends and being a little bit more have a little bit more courage to share i would say um and i know that there's still work in progress i still I still have a hard time with anger because I know it's there and it's also showing up, but I wish it wasn't, but it, you know, but I'm, I'm, I think it's what it has helped me to become is a bit, is a bit more present in everything that's going on, all the emotions as well. And um, a huge lesson for me is that I do not have to believe all the emotions that I'm feeling. Wow. I don't, ha I don't have to identify with everything that's happening inside of me. So my emotions is, when I feel it in my body is from throat to heart area. So my, how I breathe, how I, and stuff like that. And before the Enneagram, I was like, oh, I now feel something here. So something must be wrong or, or I have to react on what I'm feeling. Where now I just, what would you say, try to embrace it more and say, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so I feel this now. Hmm. I wonder where this come from. So trying to be more present in, in the feelings and just like an, a thought could be false, so could a feeling. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I fall in love with an idea of being somebody else or doing something else, well, maybe before I would go for it because I felt that I had to do it. Now yeah. I can, I can take it, uh, take it easy, you know. Oh, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah. So I want to name a few things that are just really powerful, profound in, in your insights and also read some of the wonderful comments that have been coming in that have just been, you know, testaments to the amount of growth it takes for you to have that um, degree of what I would say first, uh, the, sh the tricky shift that a self-preservation for needs to make. Right. Whereas other fours may have a little more direct access to permission to even acknowledge those feelings. You took the step of first acknowledging, like becoming aware of the feelings and then aware of your fear that, oh, I didn't let that happen because it would maybe hurt the room. It would overtake me it, mm. because of the power it could have. Then you were, So you started to then acknowledge that these feelings are here. And then the second step is is really key, which is then recognizing um, this the core a core false belief for all fours is I am what I feel yeah. the core false belief so to be able to shift that like oh 
I can have these feelings, but they don't, they're not master over my life. Like, you know, their thoughts, their feelings, we can choose, you know, there's, there's sort of discretion within that. And so there's something about where, I mean, many fours, the, the struggle is the belief that if I am my feelings, and if I'm not in the mood, we're not doing it, even if it's good for me, right? Right. And so to be able to name like, yes, I feel this, but that's not going to be what directs me is, is super powerful. And, and the word I use is objectivity, which is we can almost describe foreness as a kind of over subjectivity, you know, like there's that like self referential piece where the, the reference of the feelings becomes like my life, like dominates yeah. my yes. life, right? It can sabotage me, right? objectivity the four can go to the high point of the one and be like let me think about this <laughs> like there's a yes. principle to it there's something bigger than me what's my long-term objective even if this is my short-term feeling you know so that's that's a really powerful move that moves that four when we're talking about the four hiding out in the closet or you know on the ground waiting that's the move that says oh i'm the one i've been waiting for like like there's something that i am that is different from what I'm feeling. And that has choice in this moment to look at my long term goals to look at the context of this room and then make mm. like an informed decision about like how to show up, you know, so just I want to honor like how beautiful that is to, to I and mean, even in the way that you humbly shared to practice it, you know, because, you know, it's not like, oh, here, I bought it now, you know, but sort of as a way, uh, as a noticing, right? And that your practice is giving you a capacity to notice those things more. And that means also, if you have more permission to have your feelings and trust that that's okay, then now you're also um, countering being a male, being in the military, you know, already with a story about quashing your suffering, you're countering all that to actually now share your feelings more mm, with your parents. Exactly. That's huge, you know, like, like so big, you know, like, and, and, and so, so again, but more from like an objective place, right? Not in a way that gets, that gets lost in it, you know? And, and so, so yeah, if it, there's anything that came up for you as I was sharing, I'd love to hear. Actually, it was because I remember, especially when I was younger, falling in love with ideas or persons happened constantly okay so the emotion of falling in love it just happened all the time and um i remember being uh, with an ex-girlfriend and having this these feelings for somebody else and instantly trusting those feelings so i knew that i have to remove myself from the relationship i was in because how could i be there if i also had these kind of emotions for somebody else but in real, what if we go to that objective place? It was a fantasy. Right. It was pure imagination, and it was very, very filtered, just like Instagram with all that stuff. Because, because I only wanted to show me some kind of romantic idea of her, of this woman and myself, uh, not with her crazy ex girlfriend, not with her financials issue or whatever she drama she also had no, no 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 that was all filtered out of my imagination so i had these emotions and the the second after that shame come, came along wow. and especially uh, before i uh, learned about the enneagram shame was like always there it always followed me uh, and all these fantastic moments in my head uh, where I could really enjoy these feelings, but then in the second, right after that, bang! Don't forget that you have this was your path, or you choose this and this and this, and shame on you. And how can you feel like that? So what I also learned through the enneagram is that's just a pattern. It's just a pattern, and I don't have to trust that fantasy. And instead of sh being ashamed about it. I actually started to enjoy it. You know, it's like, okay, thank you, imagination, for that <laughs> momentary, small, crazy dream. Because I know in the, like, the next second, it's gone anyway. Mm. 
and that that was a way of coping with this with the shame uh, and uh, and yeah i can encourage everybody out there who's type 4 to just you know just say thank you for all those things that your experience because you don't have to act on it you don't have to yeah yeah such such sage counsel mm. um as as you were sharing uh what struck me is definitely the importance of talking about shame in relation to all fours right and the the trickiness of even coming to greater self-awareness along the path of personal growth and spiritual unfoldment, that um, that shame can crop up in any moment, right? Like, and that I think fours of all types need a kinder and gentler path. Uh, and, and, and as you pointed out, even a little bit humorous, right? Like, like you can kind of play with that voice and laugh yeah. at it, but only because now you have more objectively identified it as, hey, this looks an awful lot like the fours narrative, doesn't it? You know, like maybe this is not true. Maybe my foreness tends to cause my psyche to look at what's not here. Oh, exactly. look at that. You know, like now I know that I'm not going to give so much re authenticity to it. Because right before, this is my authentic feeling. I'm in love. I must follow, you know, <laughs> like, and now it's like authenticity. I think when fours do their personal growth work, authenticity has a broader holding before it was like what I feel is what's authentic yeah. now it's now it's my again my longer term life more objectively pragmatically even you know with that strong self press pragmatically like hey I can be aware that I'm quote in love with a fraction of this person's life like yeah. just a little picture of her life but if I get real you know, like, what, sh what are her finances like? <laughs> like, does she have a job? <laughs> like, what's her health? Like, where does she live? Like, is this realistic, you know? <laughs> and yeah. like, be able to like, have that bigger picture, but also to not shame yourself because our type structure habituates toward what it does. And, mm -hmm. and so we can witness it and recognize it, you know? And it's like, oh, okay, there it is doing that again. My type likes to, in the passion of envy, coupled with the mental fixation of fantasizing, compare and contrast. And what's here is never as good as what's there. Like that's the story, you know? That's the, that's the fable, really, the myth of the type. And so, no, you, so it sounds like knowledge of the Enneagram type helps you to name the stories when they appear, to know it for what it is, and to make a different choice, and even to affirm like, it sounds like almost like a gratitude practice, right? Of like what you have. Yeah, yeah. Right? do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else you want to share about that? Just that. Yeah. I think you hit it right on. <laughs> you were on the spot right there. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So I'm curious, you talked earlier about your feelings and access to your feelings. Um, what happens now like like in terms of how you experience feelings in your in your body in your life etc i i think i pay more attention to them and i think i give them more uh, love because um i found out that the more i'm trying to deal with them by myself or just uh, try to hide them the the harder it gets so try to accept them a little bit more but uh yeah just like anger is also a work in progress <laughs> um yeah 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 beautiful beautiful and um i know you gave some advice for other fours out there with regard to the hey just because you get this in your head that like there's something over there. Don't necessarily yeah. jump on that. Like if, you know, for other fours who are maybe even just beginning or in the middle of their journey, like um, what kind of counsel would you offer around, around this journey? Yeah. You're good enough. Oh, 
Yeah. And don't be, don't be anybody else. They're already taken, right? So be, be you. Because, uh, you know, I had image I had image issues when I was young. I wanted to stand out. I wanted to be different. I wanted to be notable. Don't worry. You will be. You don't have to do or be anything else. Um, and I remember when I was younger, I was... Uh, I was living on a boarding school for a year, and and that was a big lesson right there. You couldn't hide, you couldn't play a role or be anything else. You had just had to be you. Mm-hmm. And and you, you are more than your emotions. Yeah. 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 So beautiful. You're getting all sorts of hearts thrown at you here. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish um. I'd be- do, I wish you could do a better job of reading all the comments. Sorry, I'm still relatively new to Instagram, but basically just hearts everywhere, people. <laughs> so, oh. just Patrick, you're just getting hearts everywhere. And, and <laughs> so sending love back to all of you, for sure. Um, as you were sharing, Patrick, that last thing, and I, I, um, I want to honor your time here and, and start to wind down, but that last thing you shared uh, reminded me of You know, most people only know the Enneagram of personality. It's become popular, right? But there is the Enneagram of holy ideas. And so it's this idea that like each personality type has lost sight of one like facet of unity, one face of God, if you speak in those terms, but really a face of reality. And for the type four, this is called holy origin, holy origin, right? And so like origin being the the root of the word original, like being original, being unique. And so, but having lost sight of like the origin of your own being, like on the deepest level, that connection to like spirit or the sacred, you know, the force like cast out here, doesn't belong. So, oh shoot, I better, I better be special. Like if I'm going to get any sort of love here, I better like stand out because I'm like way over here. Like I'm outside the fabric of life you know and the beauty of the rem- the path of self remembering is that path of coming back to the holy idea of holy origin that because exactly what you said which is something so important for all four us to hear which is that you are intrinsically unique like part of this fabric you know like when you're grounded in like your origin everyone comes out as this unique expression right there's no efforting to be something that you're you're not and and the the biggest lesson there when you know i was actually just chatting with a four um that i was interviewing yesterday around oh yes um whenever I go into a workplace and everyone's wearing black or something you're like i have to wear slightly different you know like that that compulsion to stand yeah. out in a way that feels unique when i'm like you can wear all black and be unique like that's exactly. the thing you can look like everyone else but you will never look like everyone else and that like that profound learning that you don't have to distinguish yourself because the compulsion to always stand out c- creates the very life in which you perpetuate never belonging, right? You never get to let yourself belong. And I think, you know, what you're giving yourself is the gift of belonging. I know, and I forgot to mention, you know, after the IEA Denmark group that uh, where I met Patrick, we're now with this very special, amazing group. I see folks from this group called Sex and the Enneagram. This is like this interdisciplinary group of folks. I don't know how I ended up in it, you know, because I'm not like a sex therapist or anything, but love it. And Patrick's in it. And this is how we got to know each other. But like, I feel, I feel like you give also what you receive and uh, what you want in that group, right? Meaning mm. my experience of you is you give belonging. Like, I, you know, my being newer to the group than you, like you had this warm welcome. I have this awareness of how when others are speaking and I haven't spoken, you know, during the whole hour, you'll explicitly invite me in, you mm. know, and I was, I've always been so touched and I just noticed that was like, you offer the gift of belonging, you know, and that's such a powerful gift that like that i hope you can feel that sense for yourself you know yeah 
as well, you know, like, like just free, like given, like, you know, as a given. So, so super sacred work. I have a question that came up in the comments from John Greenleaf Maple, who's one of my dear friends. Um, he, he asked about anger. Like, you know, it's up away, so I'm going to see if I can scroll, but like, he'd like to know how you feel after expressing anger. Maybe also as a, as, as a man, you know, he identifies as a nine who's a withdrawn type. Of course, you know, nines don't have the, the easiest relationship to anger, but, but yeah, but I think that there's also healing for other men out there to see you uh, in a place where you're open about your feelings as well, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, what happens for you when you express your anger in particular? So actually the, the, the length of an emotion is very short. I mean, you can only be angry about something in this in a actually quite short time after that you need to like re re experience the the whole event to to maintain that emotion and i'm like a pro in doing that so i can take the emotion i can take the experience and i can relive it over and over again just to to keep this emotion alive and that skill scares the hell out of me because mm -hmm. it also happens to anger it also happens to anything else and being in anger for such a long time it's just like it's so draining and it's, it's, it's so hard and and uh, it, it, i'm i just can't get over it that easy it's still there but I'll, I'll probably show you that it's it's that i'm over it but it's somewhere inside of me i'm hurt and and or still angry and yeah and you can't do anything about it sorry <laughs> yeah so because I'm, I'm, I, my my pattern is to really re-experience the emotions because that's what i've always done mm. Mm. wow and so you so you can be scared of being angry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have you found effective ways um not that you need to i think there is such value in just being with you know whatever you're feeling and letting it move um have you found ways that are helpful for intercepting or interrupting that thread you know because what i'll say is there's it's one thing to feel a feeling and a lot of times in my one-on-one -on -one work with people the work we do is like hey all feelings are valid you know let yourself feel the feeling but don't recycle them yes. don't <laughs> right that's where you're like that's that's not about authenticity like you're perpetuating it through a story usually mm. right and so that telling of a story often happens but i'm curious if there are any certain ways in which you do whether it's through friends <laughs> maybe just friends telling you <laughs> to stop you know yeah, I, I for sure I have a, at least two things that I do. The first thing is that I start cleaning, or oh, yeah. uh, uh, I just you know using my hands and do laundry, do something, uh, just to activate my body. Um, if I if if that if that's like a wrong wrong place and time, um, playing like a computer game stuff like that, you know, disappear for for all the thoughts and the emotions just being that game or entertainment that there is and then it's like after that you forgot what just happened okay so yeah 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 no that's great uh, hilarious i was a little distracted by uh, our friend sam who's in our sex and the enneagram group sharing that's the most self-pressed thing i've ever heard anger cleaning it's <laughs> so working like, sam <laughs> Lindsay, strong self press is like yeah yes no, um, but I want to say something about that. It may not just be, okay, so he's being productive, awesome. But I want to add that what was beautiful about that, that I think could be helpful for everyone listening, is what you did is you got in your body as well. That, that there's something about that piece that is like, oh, I'm yeah, not just exactly. with these feelings. And, and so that reminds me, I know for me, like, like we forget this sometimes. We're like, oh, we're just going to process this. We're going to psychological i'll sit with this and i'm like oh or i could go for a jog and like my state could change 
you know, like, or even yeah. anger for me, especially because anger, I, I hold this tension, right? Like that there's something valuable uh, of not talking ourselves out of something, not shaming ourselves out of it, but actually physically venting the feeling physically expressing like movement in a way that supports. So my guess is that there's something related to that around, around, you know, the very productive and self pres attribute of, of cleaning the, <laughs> cleaning the place when you're angry, you know, but and yeah. Then the, and then the music, you know, right. I don't know what, what it is, but through music, uh, things just change. Mm. You know, mu mu can, move can change and yeah. So, Everything can change with a nice song. Yeah, yeah, that's a great tool as well. Yeah, and and definitely. So if you're trying to move out of anger, ch choosing more peaceful music, or if you're trying to move out of sadness, and I want to say that with the fours I work with, sadness, like they'll explicitly, they're just more conscious of it now. Like Nian, okay, I spent Saturday listening to sad tunes and sulking all day, but I chose it. Right, yeah. like, like there's something very conscious, and then, you know, to choose out of it, to know that, like, you can, you can let yourself kind of enjoy some of that sweet sorrow, right? You know, and yeah. and yes, you can change your mood, or you can recycle it, right? And sometimes we can choose recycling it and not shame ourselves for it, right? Like, and and like let that be okay too, because I wanna I wanna close by saying, oh, oh. John has one more question. So I know this is probably very personal. John's asking, are you able to tell your wife you're angry? Uh, no. <laughs> John's but probably she suffering can, now. <laughs> but, but she can sense it. Um, so just like the quiet way to be dramatic. They, we're very, I think, because we are so emotional types, it's very clear how we feel. Uh, but me telling you, you know, me creating a conflict? No, uh, I'd rather not. Um, yeah. I'd, they're not just try to suffer through it. Okay, so so that's that's the pattern. And I know now maybe actually trying to speak up and you know be maybe a little more sexual for be a little more courage would help. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Beautiful. Thank you. And Misty had to go, said such an amazing conversation. I have to go back to work. Hope to see you all soon. So I realized that the recording won't uh, record all the comments. So I want to make sure to, to um, read them out loud and apologize for those I missed. Thank you so much, Patrick. I'm um, such a, a touching share and I'm so grateful for your openness. I know, I mean, it's, again, the context of being male in the military, you know, with that sort of more withheld stance to be able to openly share here. I mean, I know blesses all of us and, and especially, you know, for the men I know that I work with who struggle with like honoring and making space for what they feel like that's, this is just an extra gift, I think to them, they're like, oh God, I'm not alone. Because sometimes some of the men I work with do feel that way, you know, that like our, our culture isn't habituated to honor that emotive aspect in, in maleness. And I think, you know, you being able to integrate it in this way, demonstrably, publicly, supports all of us, you know? And I think it supports the healing for those who've been hurt by male, like withholding, you know, in that area as well. And to know that you're on a journey with us as well in terms of, yeah, you know, w when do I learn to express? When am I withholding? You know, what am I looking out there versus here, you know, and, and all that stuff together. So thank you, Valerie says, thank you, Nian and Patrick, super insightful, help me understand. Oh, my self pres husband even more. That's so great. And Lindsay, so wonderful. So we got a lot of representation here for our sex from our sex in the Enneagram group. And John says <laughs> yes. So so thank you again. Oh, I wanna share at the end, like if you wanna talk about so the global conference patrick is on the team to put on the global conference in stockholm next year what are the dates of that conference again uh, i think it's 26 to 29th of may of may of uh, next yeah it's uh, the, the theme is together again with Beautiful. a human touch and i mean we really need that we, we we need to be together again and 
and the and the the program will be more you know more about that so i know there's been like a huge conference online where a lot of teaching was going on and and it was very very fascinating to be part of that also but but now the world need to get be to get together again and uh, yeah i really hope to to see some of you guys over there in in yes. stockholm sweden yeah yes wonderful i plan on being there and Valerie and Lindsay, who were interviewed before, will be there in Stockholm too. So any of you all who are watching feel kind of excited at the prospect of being in Stockholm next year, come join us. All right. Yeah. Thank you again, Patrick. I adore you. And Thank I'm you. so grateful for you. Yes. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>